All right. Welcome back to the program. Please join me in welcoming our guest for this evening, Dr. Narco Longo. Dr. Longo, how are you tonight, sir? I'm doing good. How are you, Zach? I'm doing well. Thank you very, very much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Appreciate you staying up late. Uh, so I, 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 let me actually show everybody your channel because this is the reason that you and I are speaking tonight. My fiance and I came across your channel on YouTube. Uh, you have a, a vast array of videos, lots of different subjects, but you started out, the first videos that I saw posted were <laughs> Jordan Peterson and, uh, <laughs> and Ben Shapiro in uh, binaural beats and uh, 432 hertz uh, uh, sounds. And I just, I thought that was hilarious. And then I went and checked out your Instagram and I was like, this dude's totally based. Uh, plus you're down here in Florida. So uh, I knew that I had to have you on the program. Um, I guess uh, before we get into like any specific <laughs> subjects, I would like to know, and I would like the audience to know just a little bit uh, about who you are. And uh, I guess more specifically, how did you come upon this type of research, looking into the history of Florida and uh, the magic and mystery that we have around us? Uh, you know, I don't want to bore people too much with the old, the old story. Uh, I'm sure I've told it a, a hundred times on, on my channel, but, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> really stoned right now. Also, uh, <laughs> just, <laughs> I'll just come out and say that right now, but, uh, just rip the bandaid off. <laughs> so. Well, I was born in Florida, always grew up here, um, had a nice Florida history considerably. And as I grew up, I was always somewhat conspiracy minded, um, you know, not unwilling to accept that, that we can be lied to on a massive scale. And uh, I had a couple experiences that I guess I've said kind of helped me commit to this path uh, in between when I was about 15 to 18 and uh, I'm 26 now and I'm not a doctor if people haven't noticed by now <clears throat> but uh, basically um, yeah that's it. I started uh, on YouTube about Four months ago, the uh, bi binaural Ben Shapiro videos were, <laughs> were you know, somewhat of a joke posted, I think, like six months ago or February, something like that. But uh, the real deal research, I guess, started getting posted about four months ago. And how did I start? You know, the whole Tartaria thing came out and... There's a lot of garbage thrown around in there, yeah. Too. So I wanted to do that just justice because I don't I don't like seeing my favorite topics getting steered in the direction of of fantasy and you know sci-fi. Just so I felt an obligation to kind of uh, step up and at least do my home state justice. And the other side of that was pretty much no one was covering Florida at all in an old world context. So I uh, just started snooping around basically. And uh, I already had kind of a good framework to work from being an astrologer and uh, yeah. So if you don't mind my asking, w would you be willing to tell us what that experience was that you had when you were 15 or so? Well, it didn't mean much to me at the time, but understanding it, looking back, I had a run-in with a uh, invasive bufo toad when I was about 15 years old. Are those the the, the, the psychedelic toads? Yeah, <laughs> okay. yes. The They're not the desert toads, but they're cane toads, and they have the same, same toxins, poisons, right? Yeah. And basically, I was poisoned in both my eyes by a cane toad they can squirt their poison at you know six feet up in the air oh wow and uh i was up to no good one day on a golf course and i got squirted by po poison in my eye and um 
you know, that didn't that didn't trigger any overt awakening in that moment. But for what it's worth, that that had to have some some um, influence. And then later on, kind of the, the more overt, um, you know, what led to me thinking kind of differently than, than others uh, was I saw a UFO with some friends. Oh, wow. And that that was only weeks after that that toad incident. And basically, I saw it with a group of friends. And I'm not saying it was alien. You know, that's an important distinction. UFO yes. does not mean extraterrestrial, right? Just it unidentified. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't mean, um, uh, what's his face? Uh, David Wilcock in, a, in, <laughs> in, in, in Spanx in space, right? <laughs> Corey Good in the Blue Avians. <laughs> yeah. So... Did you just no no okay no that's um, enough to scare you straight <laughs> yeah I would imagine okay so w- what about the UFO I've actually had uh, uh, a number of UFO sightings and some more uh, I guess formative than others but w- what did you actually see and that's fascinating to know that you had it with other people so you can verify that. Oh yeah. So uh, one of those people is one of my best friends to this day. The other one, I'm sure I could reach, reach out to at any time to verify and his little brother. They lived, lived uh, right where we saw it. It was an old school that I went to. We were there in the middle of the night on a pretty much open, like a uh, golf sports grass area. And it was brighter than a planet bigger zipping across the sky covering you know miles at a time zipping Mm -hmm. zipping and we were terrified we were terrified ran back to my friend's house that we were you know sleeping over at and as god would have it his father was the conspiracy theorist of all conspiracy theorists nice so i actually got a full dose of 9-11, 9-11, New World Order, you know, all the good stuff <clears throat> at about 15 years old. After I came home, we, we came home screaming bloody murder. We yeah. just seen seen a UFO in the sky. And and uh, his dad had actually, my friend's father had actually worked on technology that was used in the Matrix film. Okay. Had, himself had committed to a path of kind of telling the truth moved to florida as a result right yeah and uh he was one of my closest friends growing up his family and uh yeah so i inherited a lot of you know uh early low-level conspiracy type whatever you want to call it conspiracy knowledge through that and that was really it well, that's awesome. Uh, you know, m- my channel name, Red Pill 78, uh, that's the year that I was born is 1978. And so the joke was that I was red pilled mm-hmm. since birth because I had some <laughs> some uh, some influences in my own life that kind of set me on this path very early, like, you know, around the eight years of age, like learning about the JFK assassination uh, and, uh, and, and realizing that elements of our own government assassinated him. And, uh, you know, if they're willing to do that, what are they, you know, not willing to do? I mean, it's quite obvious there's uh, there's so much happening behind the scenes. So, okay, so that's really awesome. Uh, I love hearing that. And um, when it came to the idea of Tartaria, how did you learn about the concept of Tartaria? Right. So before the Tartaria movements sort of happened, I was familiar with just the basic Tartars and, mm-hmm. you know, the subdivision, you know, the, the smaller part of Russia or that, that area, Tartarstan, that goes by that name. Um, and I was familiar with the term Tartar, mm-hmm. how Tartar gets thrown around to, to, to describe other people, a mm-hmm. lot of times in a military context. Um, but I had the privilege of being subscribed to the channel of called New Earth. 
So New Earth was a channel. I don't know if they're still up. She kind of went went on like a very apocalyptic route and kind of went cuckoo. But she was this foreign lady who would like squeak out you know, like a very hard to understand English. But the content was so incredible on this New Earth channel on YouTube. Maybe she's still up. I don't know. Uh, is her name Sylvie? Sylvie yes. Ivanova. Okay, yes. she, she is. Yep. She is still on. Uh, on YouTube, and, but it looks like the most recent video, actually it was nine days ago, update on uh, okay. prophecies fulfillment. So I don't yeah, know, that's, we'll have to check that's that the out. apocalyptic stuff. I'd stay, <laughs> stay away from that. <laughs> stay away from that playlist. <laughs> but um, the survivors of the of Atlantis okay, or um, survivors of Atlantis playlist, she actually went through pretty much the entire Tartaria reset theory. Mm -hmm. um, she was on to Anatoly Fomenko, of course, very early on. She was talking about Florida, believe it or not. So she was linking up all the star forts, the world fairs, the typical things you hear that that kind of let loose after the Tartaria floodgate. Yeah, um, you know, kind of broke in like 2017. Uh, around there and i was kind of late to the party like i did not hear about tartaria tart tartaria like this whole movement until yeah. a little bit later um i was really just more deep into like astro theology and stuff like that and uh but this new earth channel you know had all the the nuts and bolts of the tartaria theory she was talking about ancient canals in Florida, about how all these waterways in Florida are, you know, just very unlikely to be natural. How some of these canals and, you know, it's not just Florida, it's New Orleans, the Gulf Coast of Texas. She was talking about all this stuff well before I had ever get, got onto the whole Atlantis um, in the sense that I was looking at it how it's the same myth as the garden of eden mm -hmm. she was looking at it more from this um old world architecture perspective how you see the same architecture popping up all over and at the end of the day it is the same thing but that's really how i got you know um briefed on a lot of this tartarian stuff new earth so shout out to her right on and <clears throat> So the first time I ever heard of Tartaria was, I guess, roughly 20, 2018, 2019. I saw John Levi on, on YouTube. And, um, you know, I, I guess I am totally on board with the idea that uh, ancient civilizations have come and gone. We've had resets here and our history is hidden and, uh, you know, humanity is far older than we know. But... I actually just recently did a show with a couple of friends kind of going over the, uh, the the general evidence for Tartaria. And I guess I am interested to know, based upon your research, what do you see as kind of the fantastical evidence or, you know, uh, supporting arguments for Tartaria versus what you believe to actually be evidence that Tartaria was a thing? I think the... First thing that has to be cleared up is Tartaria is like, you know, admittedly a misnomer. It's so like a concept rather than like an actual uh, uh, civilization. Yes. Okay. It gets thrown around very loosely. I throw it around very loosely. Sure. I'm unashamed to, to hurl it around. But um, Tartaria, of course, like I said, literally applies to a small area in Eurasia right mm -hmm. well when you look back there was a grand tartary there right. was a tartary that pretty much went from um turkey if not farther west all the way to japan and all the way down to india all the way up to mm -hmm. finland right so that's, you know, half the globe right there. Mm -hmm. Now, where does it pass into misnomer? And where is that word getting thrown around? <clears throat> well, I have seen maps that do label North America as Tartary. 
especially really? especially in the north like canada okay i've heard people say that these are faked and that these are like wishful yeah wishful wishfully made maps like 4chan maps you know <laughs> yeah. so i and i don't have any of those saved in my in my files because of that but where do we get some some truth mm-hmm. to this because the whole tartaria theory you know really relies on was it in the americas if mm-hmm. there if it was in the americas that does make it a global civilization correct and that that really does give meaning to what people think is this tartaria movement now it also should be said there's a great deal of fantasy sci-fi and just downright like mental illness yes that's exhibited in the tartarian community Mm -hmm. where it's you know i'll be the first to say it you have people that are so uh discontented with to modern society Mm -hmm. they don't want to get a job and i don't blame them they don't want to do this they don't want to do that you know they feel like they're in a slave system. They hate the architecture. They hate the food. And we are, people are kind of projecting a wishful future into the past. Mm-hmm. They're creating a future they want to see in the past. Yes. So I'll admit there is a lot of that going on. You can, <laughs> like, there's a lot of bullshit out there. Oh, but yeah. there was an old world. Rome did erase at least half of the world's history. Rome had two incarnations, the Roman Empire and the Roman Catholic Church, Mm -hmm. and were largely still under the influence of that regime. Mm -hmm. So who are we to say? Well, well, let's back it up. Where's like some actual evidence of Tartary? Well, Tartary, Tartars kind of is used to um, describe the Hun. Right. I was going to say Ging- Genghis Khan, really. And like Mongolian hordes, yes. right? Yeah. We hear the golden horde. Well, ha- where does that fit into American history? I'll tell you. Okay. I- I've said it a lot on my channel and every historian would, you know, um, basically roll their eyes at this. The, the phenotypes that we see in the northern United States and Canada are largely of Asiatic origin. Are you saying like Native American phenotypes? You're talking about yes, European Native Southern American. Person. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Important distinction. Yeah. Native American phenotypes, what we call Native American. Like I like I've said, the po- the typical stereotypical the unfair depiction of Pocahontas Mm -hmm. and what Eskimos look like, what Eskimos Inuit people look like. Well, Inuit is actually the same root as the Ainu of Japan. Okay. Ainu, the Inuit. So these are Asiatic people. And we do know that they came across the Bering Strait. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because thousands of them speak Finnish to this day forms of Finnish like the 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 Sami are the the Sami the the native Finn yes Sami well native is misleading as well okay Uh, in according to my theories my research we are leaving the mainstream right here I believe the northern some of the north of many of the northern Native Americans to be of Asiatic origin. Well, that's actually exactly what they tell you in the schools. I, I've definitely they, heard that before. They just tell you that it's, you know, five million years back or so, or a hundred thousand years or whatever, whatever the out of Africa timeline proposes. Mm-hmm. I don't even know it because it's such uh, nonsense. <laughs> Basically, they went, somebody did cross the Bering Strait, though. They just push that date back far, far, far back. And they say, this is how every American entered Mm -hmm. the Americas. Well, what I'm saying is that was actually a very recent Asiatic horseback archer culture that left a very strong impression on native culture. And this is why you see your Apaches and Mm -hmm. horse horsebacked natives that are very, very 
different from the natives you find in the Southeast United United States who were not who. Sorry. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, let, let's actually talk about that timeline. I mean, I, I am not a proponent of the out of Africa theory either. I, I, I've i seen that uh, you follow Robert Sepaher. He I'm also a big fan of Robert Sepaher. So uh, I definitely looked into this quite a bit. And, uh, you know, I mean, talking about phenotypes, I mean, you can just look at genetics and uh, it's quite obvious that, you know, if if every single person on the face of the earth had come from Africa, then there would be common DNA among them. And that just doesn't exist. But based upon your research and your understanding, what was that actual movement like? And uh, and, and what is the timeline we're talking about? The timeline is very much up for debate. But okay. the movement, but the movement of people and ethnic groups is not. There's not much wiggle room for debate. Okay. In a, a large group of Asiatic people, what we would call Asiatic or Chinese Mongolian phenotypes, mm -hmm. left left Asia and crossed the Bering Strait at the late at the farthest back. At the farthest back. I would say this is 7,000 years back Okay. at the, at the farthest. And this could only be a thousand years back, 800, because this would coincide. A thousand, a thousand years. Wow. That's, that's <laughs> very recent, much more well, recent than I thought. Well, you know, if you know about this whole Moorish um, uprising, that's kind of happening um, online. People are realizing the original Native Americans are not what were shown in the movies, which mm -hmm. all are kind of the same Pocahontas looking, feather wearing, beads, leather, deer skin. And we're just kind of, shown, you know, given the image that that was all over the United States. Right. We're not, you know, there's, there has, Pretty much been not a single uh, major movie, Hollywood movie that's shown native Floridians. Why? Because they're all six foot four plus, uh, <laughs> you know, some of them living hundreds of years old uh, these, people that look that look like they're from North Africa. These would be the, the Seminoles or is this another tribe and, and the Seminoles well, is just like a mop up job? The Seminoles were six foot four average. That's very, very tall wow. for, for living out in, in the wild. Now, the Tamukua, who were here 500 years ago, when the Spanish and French first showed up, they were eight feet tall, close to eight feet tall, and over 300 years old. They lived to over 300 years old, in the words of the Spanish and the French. So, so those were from firsthand uh, Spanish and French settlers coming here and seeing them did they yes. was this just written in uh, uh like in like uh like diaries or written accounts or was there any uh any artwork a written that... okay. yes a written and an engraving and i i could show you an engraving if you'd like to see absolutely yeah let me these are um, made these are made by host. theodore de bry theodore de bry okay can you see my screen i yeah definitely can Okay, we're going in right here. See that? Yep, yep. Nice. Okay, here they are preparing a feast. Mm -hmm. These are the Tamukua natives. Blah, blah, blah. We can skip a little. As a result of which they live for a long time. For one of their chiefs assured me that he was 300 years old and that his father whom he showed me, was 50 years older than he. And I can truly say that when I saw him, I thought I was looking at no more than human bones covered with skin. Wow. They, cer they certainly put Christians to shame, who reduced their span of life by holding immoderate feasts and drinking parties. And who deserved, who deserved to be handed over for training to these base, uncivilized people and brutish creatures in order to learn restraint? So what did they attribute their long lifespans to? Well, I don't think the Spanish um, or the French in this case, mm -hmm. this is a, a French encounter um, 
I don't think they understood their culture mm -hmm. very well, but right here it says just moderation by eating more moderately and having feasts. At, I'm going to fill in some blanks here. Sure. What I what I would assume would be harmonious times. Mm -hmm. So they would they would feast when it's proper to do so, whereas Europeans they're saying feast indiscriminately. Right. If they feel if they feel like feasting, they feast. And that is bad for the body in in their their opinion. So do you think do you think there's any connection to the lifespan of this tribe and the idea that the fountain of life <laughs> is uh, yep. is supposedly here in St. Augustine? I've been there, I've drank from it, so we'll see what happens. Well, you can see they're mixing some fluids back mm -hmm. there. I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and there's a hole in the ground, a hole cut in the ground that mm -hmm. he's pouring water into. That's interesting. That is well, strange. You, you know, Florida is the highest. Florida has the highest concentration of freshwater springs in mm -hmm. the world. Okay. Not many people know that. You're not really taught that in school. You're not shown that in the advertisements, the tourism marketing well that's because it's a well-kept secret that's because uh nestle pulls millions of gallons out of there mm. that's because coke used to own many uh, much of the rights to florida spring water for decades mm -hmm. and they kind of just uh hot potato the rights of these the florida spring water once they get start getting too much um kickback or not kickback uh Pushback. Pushback. Thank you. Pushback from the public. And then they just trade the rights off to someone else, to some other big company. And Florida, Floridians should have full access to these springs. The, yes. the quality of life for not only Floridians, but the entire world would be improved greatly if this spring water were allowed to be bottled and distributed and there might be some people who say distilled water is better for you and that's okay if you believe so that's fine too but to your point you're absolutely correct and i'm going to show you this is not the only instance of people living long in florida okay. in fact F florida is the land of long life really but like i said they're giants so let's not forget about that part they were tall, and I told you I had some some evidence of that. Mm -hmm. So here is the Tamukua, same tribe. Those are French conquistadors mm -hmm. on the right on the right there. Now, I think his name's Laudonaire. Yeah, Laudonaire. And basically, that pillar, that obelisk, that Stanley Kubrick looking thing, uh, the natives built for him as a gift. With, well, with, with the crest on it? Exactly. With the fleur de lis. Yeah. How is that? How'd that happen? Yeah. I don't, I don't know. You're going to have to track down the uh, <laughs> the engraver. He died 400 years ago, but um, blah, 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 blah. You can read all that if you want to screen cap it, people. This chief, Athor, is an extremely handsome man, intelligent, classic, classic, French dude, am I right? An extremely <laughs> handsome man, intelligent, reliable, strong, of exceptional height, exceeding our tallest man by a foot and a half, and endowed with a certain, okay, and endowed with a certain restrained dignity, so that in him a remarkable majesty shone forth. Oh, what's this here? He, he married, married his mother, his mother <laughs> and by her raised more children of both sexes, whom he produced for us by slapping his thigh. God damn. <laughs> and indeed, after she had been betrothed, betrothed to him, his father, Saturiwa, did not touch her anymore. That's how it goes. Oh, he just ruined don't, it for don't, me. <laughs> don't, don't you hate when that happens? Yes, yes. Oh, it was it was such a promising story right up until that moment. OK, so what are we looking at now uh, is are these giant alligators? Well, we just saw that these yeah. Tamukua average at least about seven foot tall because mm -hmm. the, the tallest guy on this expedition was about six foot six foot three. OK, so if you're if you're a foot and a half taller than that, you're pretty damn tall. Yeah, you're close to eight feet tall, seven foot nine. 
about. I am. I'm. I'm just. I, I'm still stuck on the obelisk. The is. Do they? Do they mention what the obelisk is made of? Is that a stone obelisk? Because it looks like it, it's stone. It was probably Kakina. Kakina. It was probably okay. Kakina. This limestone clumped up shell that pretty much all of Florida is made of. Yes. That's what. That's what the coral castle's made of. That's yeah. what saint augustine's made of mm-hmm. but yeah yeah okay all right that that makes sense that makes sense okay so, so in, in 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 keeping with the uh uh, uh i guess the theme of uh, the people being larger uh i guess it kind of looked like in the next picture that extended to the animals as well well that's what it's looking like zach <laughs> and uh we just saw these guys are seven feet tall well if they're seven feet tall how tall, how long does that make these alligators? Now, we know alligators do not stop growing. Mm-hmm. That's not a conspiracy theory, okay? I don't watch Bigfoot Channel, guys. Now, um, I'm not into cryptids like that. These are real. You know, you can even look back in the fossil record. There were alligators this big they'll just tell you it was like 20 million bazillion jillion years ago mm-hmm. right all i'm saying is this was much more recent than you'd think this was like biblical times mm-hmm. not jurassic times and if those guys are seven plus foot tall that's easily a 20 30 foot gator oh yeah i was gonna say 30 to 40 feet but yeah oh yeah oh yeah and well, they're pretty long, and maybe these artists were taking some liberty. Maybe mm-hmm. they were being a little dramatic. Perhaps. Here's here's pretty much the same picture, mm-hmm. mi- mirrored kind of with a different background. Um, it almost looks like these these Indians are wearing like a, 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 a like a helmet. They look like I mean, I suppose it it could be thatched or something like that. But mm-hmm. I mean, it, they look like they'd be metallic, like copper or bronze, maybe. Well, they tell us that that that's their hairdo. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if I believe that. You can see they weave feathers into mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Now, um, if you've ever looked at the channel Mind Unveiled, he does a good video about bald natives. That mm. in America there were a whole tribe of natives, and I kid you not, that had completely male pattern balding. So the men. The women and the children had male pattern balding. Okay. And this is actually where scalping culture comes from, is that that tribe would scalp off the top section of someone's head and cover their, (laughs) like a toupee would cover their male baldness. Okay. No, I don't, I don't think he covers that part in the video. I could be wrong. The scalping part, but that could be true with, with, these i've heard that said or postulated by some historians like mainstream historians that these are taken um scalps like a full-headed scalp Mm -hmm. worn worn as a hat and that could be complete nonsense that could just be their hairdo but i agree with you they do it it is a strange hairdo yeah okay and um now here's a picture of them and you can see the different differences in size going on here. How these women are women dancing are substantially smaller mm-hmm. than the men sitting and the queen sitting up there at the top. Now when the Europeans got here they actually said that these people in particular the Temucua looked most like the Picts of of uh the British Isles, like Ireland and Scotland. Okay. Because they were tattooed and had um, typically lighter skin because they were, you know, tattooed. You could see their tattoos. Sure. sure. And that's exactly what the Irish people were looking like. Okay. Uh, what at else? That time. The, the um, I mean, the people of like, uh, like, like Hawaii and, and like, you know, that, mm-hmm. you know, th- that part of the Pacific. I mean, that's the same type of thing they do. Do you think there's any yes. commonality between these peoples? Um, you know, in the grand scheme, everything over near Florida is kind of what you'd call Atlantean. Okay. And everything over in the Pacific is kind of Lemurian, mm. if that makes sense. 
Okay, what's the distinct? Okay, so Atlantean would be from the Atlantic portion, mm -hmm. and then Lemuria would be from the Pacific. Um, yeah. I had uh, I there I can't remember the name of these people, but I mean this is like Stone Age times. Um, it was on the border of France and something else. But I had heard that uh, in like southern Florida there was uh, uh, skeletons that had been dug up that were part of a Caucasian native Caucasian race that was in Florida, you know, ten thousand, fifteen thousand years ago. Do you, do you know what that is or who those people are? Absolutely. Those From the are Canarian the Canarian Islands. Or I, I, that might be well, something different, but well, I'll, I'll okay. Those yes, those dots do connect. You're right. Okay. Um, so those are the the bog bodies of Florida. Okay. Bog bodies. Those are some of the oldest burials, um, like intentional, like ceremonial burial burials in the United States, and basically, they're in Florida. So that's a big uh-oh, because mm -hmm. if people came in from the Bering Strait, that would mean you have a sophisticated culture mm -hmm. popping up in Florida when they're not supposed to. That that doesn't work in the timeline that we're right. given. So also, you have to keep in mind that the sea levels were changed. Mm -hmm. And what's so important about, you have two sites that are of extreme importance. You have the Windover Bog site, which is the one that was found in the in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And then you have the Manasota Key site, Manasota Key. And the Manasota Key offshore site is actually the same type of burial. So it's a bog burial. And the first one, the, the Windover Bog, was found in a bog above ground, right? Above sea level. Okay. Well, they found that and they found, I think, at least a hundred skeletons that were so well preserved. They weren't skeletons, they were bodies that they were so well preserved that they thought it was a murder at first. Oh wow. When they when they found them because they were so much flesh and brain matter. Uh they had complete organs intact, skin, right? They were so still a full body that they called the police and they were like, wow, this is a crime scene. Well, they, you know, qu quickly they figured out it, it was, uh, was a ancient burial, but they had to do some testing to be sure. Right. Mm -hmm. So basically, like you said, the DNA tests came out on these guys because they had so much brains in their head. They had so much, they had hair, they had everything. There was a, abundance of dna mm -hmm. so they test the dna and it comes back as european it's distinctly european and you can see the guy that tests the dna flat out tell you this is european dna i've studied dna for years mm -hmm. these are european phenotypes and i'm certain of it well then they then they start cracking down and start saying oh well that maybe this is eurasian dna Sure. Because Eurasian DNA means it's it's anything across the Atlantic and it might have came around the other side. That doesn't mean it had to come across the Atlantic, which is the narrative they have to push because that's the out of Africa theory. Mm -hmm. Well, basically, you find the same exact type of bog burials right across the Atlantic in mm -hmm. places like the Netherlands, Denmark, and most importantly, Finland. Okay. And that's, that's important. We'll come back to that. But you find these bog burials, and I'll pull up some pictures. Bog bodies. So the first one was in a lake, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then the second set that they found was in... The ocean. So this is the Windover Bog site. Okay. Greatest archaeological discoveries ever unearthed in the United States. Among the greatest. Mm -hmm. 167 bodies found in a pond in Windover, Florida. Blah, 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 blah. They were guessing the bones were 500 to 600 years old. 
but then the bones were radiocarbon dated and you know i agree carbon dating is like you know it's an inexact science ex exactly yeah. but if you have organic material and you know you know dating rocks is as is completely up in the air it's bs it's like chopping a chicken's head off right mm -hmm. well well dating organic material like this i give them a little more credence but it turns out the corpses ranged from 6,990 to 8,120 years old. Wow. It was then that the academic academic community became incredibly excited. That's not true. They became incredibly worried and they covered <laughs> they covered up pretty much the entire thing. The Windover Bog has proven to be one of the most important archaeological finds in the United States. Okay, that was in the 80s. Very recently in 2019 they found another one same deal same type of, of bog burial so this was like a s civilization spanning both coasts of florida mm -hmm. the first one was on the east coast this is on off the west coast now this one with the with the windover bog they were reluctant to ag agree with this 7000 uh, plus timeline Mm -hmm. seven seven thousand years ago timeline well when this one came out they had no choice but to swallow it why because this one being out in the ocean verifies that this occurred before the sea levels rose yeah yeah I mean, which makes it before so, before the ice caps melted probably before, but but what's in yeah yes what's important is that this substantiates the radiocarbon dating. This mm -hmm. verifies the radiocarbon dating because this is 8,000 years worth of sea level change mm -hmm. that, that matches the 8,000 timeline that the radiocarbon was guessing at. So this is very important. And this is how God works, you mm -hmm. know. The, this thing was pretty much um, corroborated on both sides of the Florida coast. And this is like a, a jewel that has slipped through the cracks. Yeah, I've that, I've that, never heard of, I've never heard this specific story before, and this seems like something that should be very very important and and well studied. But you know, we have this we have this uh, uh, th this issue with ego in the scientific community, and uh, you know, they have a, a, a an accepted line of thinking that must be followed on a variety of subjects, and archaeology is you know, and uh, and and the the migration of peoples, it, it's it's supposedly settled. And so therefore, anything that might cast that in a different light or perhaps give us a different timeline, they immediately discount it, try to uh, shove it between the cracks. You know, it might be a lack of ego. I think we might need some more ego in the scientific community. I think we might need some more testosterone. Yeah. And uh, because these are people who are afraid to step out of the box, who are afraid to, to challenge the people above them. Okay. And, you know, a lot of people kind of get fixated on the whole ego thing. When I look around, truly, when I look around, I see a lack of ego. I see a lack of sense of self. I see a lack of, you know, identity, willpower, I self assurance. So I think they try and demonize that, but that's a, that's a, another topic. Well, no, I think you're absolutely right. I, I suppose when I was when I said that, I was thinking uh, specifically about Zahi Hawass and uh, his reluctance to accept the uh, you know that there's anything different happen in in Egypt or that uh, the Egyptian culture is older. You know, it, it, he seems to be very fixated on his control over that Egyptian narrative. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, that, that was, that was what was going through my mind, but I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it would take some balls to step outside of the lines of, uh, currently accepted thinking and, uh, and, you know, and, and, and suggest that anything different is going on. But, you know, I guess maybe the biggest problem is, uh, people's fear of losing funding or of being cast out of, uh, the current scientific community. Uh, because for some reason, for whatever reason, they want us to believe that it happened a certain way and they don't want us to know that there was anything different. Mm -hmm. 
You're absolutely right. Yeah. And you do touch on a good point about Egyptology because there's so many red flags with archaeology and anthropology in Florida and America <clears throat> because they pose such a threat to the current paradigm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Egyptology, archaeology, anthropology in the Middle East, these are industries that have a very high-valued aesthetic. Mm -hmm. And that aesthetic is marketed to you with the music, with the National Geographic as this alluring, exotic, you know, ooh, ancient history. It's from the far away remote corners of, of the earth that you'll never go to. So think about this. A country the size of Texas, okay, barely bigger than Texas, Egypt I'm, re I'm referring to. Mm -hmm. Barely the size of Egypt. Sorry, barely bigger than Texas. It's artifacts and its iconography and figurines line the walls of virtually every major museum around the world. But American native uh, artifacts are not even given the time of day in its own museums, in its own country. Now, how is that? You know, America is 10 times the square, the uh, land area of egypt and i assure you it has at least 10 times the archaeological sites mm -hmm. the mum the mummies the artifacts you name it it's got it but it is all protected under a pseudo spiritual guilt trip thing that you do not find in any other country that we for some reason are brainwashed with here in america where no mound is allowed to be touched. No burial is allowed to be flipped over. And hey, I can get behind that. But the same discretion is not shown whatsoever in the Middle East, in Asia. They find something and they crack it open over sure. there. Sure. Yeah, they do. <clears throat> Here, there's it's like these Native Americans. And hey, um, like I said, I'm okay with respecting people's burials. But I'm, I don't have... I do have an issue with hypocrisy, um, you know, major discrepancies, double standards I have mm -hmm. an issue with. So I'll call those out when I see them, you know, and, and I see them when it comes to the coverage, the attention that's given to certain cultures and certain other ones. Think about what Egypt, the role Egypt plays in the narrative. Mm -hmm. Egypt is this grand civilization in Africa mm -hmm. that is the perfect ladder stepping stone from primitive uh, jungle, you know, pre-humans mm -hmm. to modern humans. So Egypt is the crux is the crux of this whole out of Africa theory. They desperately, desperately need Egypt to be the first, the oldest, the most sophisticated, and it's looking more and more like that's not the case. But they are desperately clinging to it. Because they need to sell us <clears throat> the mummy aesthetic, the right. pyramid aesthetic, the hieroglyph aesthetic, right? But I'm sure you get the picture. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> if the, the crown jewel of Egypt falls apart, then the entire uh, out of Africa timeline falls apart. <clears throat> um, so I keep uh, there. There was a there is a, a, the the the. The find that I mentioned that I just I'm sorry it escapes me and I I've, I've looked this the reason I looked into it is because uh my I had my DNA checked years ago and I specifically had uh, a, a a portion of my DNA in common with this particular archaeological find and so I looked into it years ago um, but I can't remember what it is but you know just in in doing a little bit of searching for other um, you know archaeological pieces here of this puzzle uh there was uh back in the 80s the mid 80s there was a sinkhole that opened up uh, just outside of miami that had uh, uh, uh human remains and animal bones from like ten thousand years ago including mm -hmm. a boomerang which i thought was very wow. yeah exactly they they said that it was uh apparently the oldest hunting boomerang that had ever been found and i uh, need to see that let me uh let me actually i'll drop it into the chat here and uh, and you can check this out, but um, 
You know, I had only ever heard of boomerangs being used in Australia. I mean, that's like the iconic symbol of Australia. Um, yeah. Low con- my Low Country Brooklyn, one of, one of my mods over on Rumble says, Zach, ask about the Timaquan's major cloaking because of the key lines, the hashtag pilot mountain wheel. Ask him, he should know. Do you know what she's talking about? Man, nope. I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed. <laughs> I don't know. Cloaking? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Brooklyn, you're going to have to call in. You're going to have to call in and ex- explain this to yeah, us. Uh, I'd love to learn about that. Um, also, another uh, uh, Ice Age find in florida the old vero man site in vero yes. beach florida okay what, what can i have heard that? of that one okay um he was buried with a large amount of animals clumped in okay. if i'm not mistaken i think that was mainly i i think correct me if i'm wrong if anyone knows i don't think he was of any remarkable height um but i think what was important was the was the animals he was buried with proved that a lot of these giant like ice age animals Mm -hmm. were living much much recently more recently in florida than people had had um realized so all these animals that got um wiped out uh up in north america uh florida was a haven of survival for many of this megafauna that was dying out in the north they were still able to live in florida okay so so thousands of years after they were extinct elsewhere you did have mastodon giant sloth american lion american cheetah american um uh giant animals sure and these are these are not dinosaurs okay a lot of dinosaurs are fake like a vast majority of the giant reptilian Jurassic Park movie dinosaurs mm-hmm. are just largely fictional. Sure. They'll even they'll even flat out tell you these are entirely artistic interpretations. They don't even they don't even know if they were feathered or scaled half right. the time. Yeah. And they'll just they'll just fill in that blank uh, liberally. But what I'm referring to are mammals that are just extinct. Mm-hmm. And I think everyone can get behind that. And I'd like to tell you, we find those all the time in Florida. If you go uh, diving, diving in one of these springs or caves, the chances you're going to find a mastodon bone are higher than anywhere else in the world. Really? Okay. Yes. People go down and find mastodon, um, mammoth, mammoth and mastodon and um, saber tooth tiger, like I said, and a lion cheetah and giant sloth those are like the most common ones they find what about cave bears i don't know about cave bear but a three-toed horse like a camel okay i've definitely heard of those type thing yeah. mm-hmm. so those were all some people say five thousand years ago okay they were still living and thriving in florida that's I mean, very very recent I mean, Whereas Buffalo yeah. roamed America not all that long ago, too. So, I mean, I think it would be very easy for uh, especially larger species because, I mean, as humans got more and more sophisticated, if their hunting abilities were, you know, really, really good, then, I mean, it would be quite easy for them to take them down. Same with, you know, mastodons and stuff. You know, people talk about like uh, vapor canopies and the atmosphere being more nourishing. Mm hmm. And that allowed the animals to be larger and the humans to be larger. Well, that's a good angle. Sure. And a lot of people cover that on YouTube. What I don't hear a lot of people talking about is when the sea level rises, the land gets smaller. Mm -hmm. And we know when animals are isolated on islands, they shrink. (laughs) You're absolutely right. Yeah. So with that effect, a continent is just an island at the end of the day. Mm Mm-hmm. And if the sea level rises, that island is getting smaller by default. Mm-hmm. Thus, every mammal on the island, every you know land animal, will get smaller. But you know that's kind of a law, a law of nature. Mm-hmm. So sea levels getting higher constrict the uh, land, right? The overall availability of land, yes. and then species get smaller, right? 
And that's that definitely seemed to happen. Right. Um, so we've got these these bog burials. Um, do we have uh, any mound burials down here in Florida? I, I mean, I've, I've read about quite a few throughout North America, but just not down here in Florida specifically. Yes. I wanted to touch on one last part about oh, okay. those bog burials. Kind of the important. See my screen? I uh, certainly can. Nice. All right. This was, I should have left in the URL. This was basically a European, a Finnish researcher who was blogging about the Windover site. And mm -hmm. I just cut out um, this little paragraph. But if you just, if you just grab two of these sentences and search it, I'm sure you could find the original. From talking with local archaeologists and Lund professors, I distinctly remembered them showing me photos and sketches of some ancient Neolithic burials in a large bog on Venn, Stormassen. These burials were exactly like the ones above. The archaeologists were intrigued because this type of burial was commonplace in southern Finland and Karelia, extreme northwest Russia, about six to 8,000 years ago, same timeline. Mm -hmm. Nordic and Russian archaeologists believe that they were the ancestors of the Sami. Judging from the films on YouTube about the Windover Bog site, Florida archaeologists don't seem to know that the burials identical to one to those in Florida can be found in southern Sweden, southern Finland, and Karelia. But given the results of the most recent DNA studies of the Windover mummified bodies, this is highly significant. You will enjoy this video. And here they give a, a picture of the, a typical pond or bog pond in Finland mm -hmm. and the Windover pond in Florida. And the burials are the same. Same yeah. type. If you just search bog body in, in Europe, you can see for yourself. And they actually had strawberry blonde hair, the ones here in Florida, too. Yes, yes. Okay, so uh, we're going to have to take a break for the second half of the show, but... I did have one additional article that I found, and it is uh, it tells me the name that I was trying to think of, Clovis, the Clovis. People. Yes. So yes. this this article, which was behind a paywall at The Guardian because they don't really want you to read it. Um, this, this is a, another site discovered in Florida as the result of a sinkhole, uh, nearly 15,000 years old with Clovis people in it. And that yes. is what I have a relation to. Yes. So. Um, you guys, we're going to open up the phones in just a second. So let me actually throw that information on screen and then I'm going to drop it into the chat. And if you have any questions, uh, comments or anything you'd like to say regarding the study of ancient peoples and the true nature of humanity, then I would love to hear from you guys in Brooklyn. I would also like to hear from you uh, in regards to uh, what you were mentioning in that super chat. Let me drop this into the uh, the chats here, and then we will be right back after this. See you in a second. If your New Year's resolution is to improve your own health like 48% of other Americans, well, here is something that can help. Support your weight management goals with this amazing keto powder. This supplement helps with attaining and maintaining a healthy body weight by helping to elevate your body's levels of ketones, which can aid with appetite management, metabolism, and your overall energy. Tens of thousands of Americans have turned to this method to help manage their weight, so what do you have to lose? Get a bag yourself for 51% off, plus receive several Several free bonuses by going to keto with redpill.com or just click the link below. And remember, when you support my sponsors, you support this channel. All right, welcome back. Thank you for sticking around, guys. We actually have our first caller on the line. But yes, Clovis people, I was trying to remember that. They are from the border of France. Uh, they can trace it back over there. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, 15,000 years ago, uh, people living here in Florida, um, you know, I would be very interested to see how the DNA lines up with all of these various ancient uh, mega or Neolithic sites, rather, uh, and uh, and how it compares to the DNA of what they say it's supposed to. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm really surprised that given all that we know, uh, all that has been revealed uh, and with, you know, just the free flow and exchange of information that we have now. I mean, why we're not seeing people in the scientific community, uh, you know, going down these lines of thought. I mean, people know, people understand that we've been lied to. 
You know, it's not just archaeology, but it are the the lies about archaeology and and uh, and the progression of humanity. It's indicative of everything else that has been covered up throughout history. I mean, this is why the uh, you know the idea of conspiracies is so popular, and why we have so much disinformation and misinformation floating around out there because people know they've been lied to, and people are looking for the truth. Uh, and uh, it's so important, I think, for people to remain skeptical about everything that you're being told, because just because the information you're being given is different from the accepted narrative doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. There's a lot of people out there who will do and say things just to get you to follow them or, or have you uh, jump on their bandwagon. But I really appreciate you, Dr. Longo, and I, I appreciate your research. Vector, you're on the air. Tiffany. Hello, Red Pill 78. Hello, Dr. <laughs> Longo. It's a pleasure to speak to you. Um, I've been researching all morning and watching your videos. So I was fascinated starting off with the Florida video about the Florida oranges and how the uh, the oranges, the, uh, you know, the the apple, you know, and, and how Florida is the Garden of Eden and the lost Atlantis and how this all links into the flood story, I do believe. And, um, you mm -hmm. know, all of giants and all of this stuff there is so much going on here bro i wish i'd found you long ago it's a pleasure to meet you um yeah man like please tell me what you think uh thanks for that i appreciate that um basically with the oranges you know you can follow all these little threads there's all these threads a lot of times i'll say follow the beards because the word beard in itself can kind of lead you to this same truth about the pre-flood people and the post-flood people. Uh, well, with the fruit, it's the same way. Um, people don't know, you know, people think, oh, Florida, citrus coming from Florida, that's ridiculous. Citrus comes from Asia. Well, did you know Columbus brought citrus with him on the very first expedition? On the third, yes. on the second or third expedition, he brought, well, yeah, sorry, you watched the videos, I'm sure you know. But um, on the second and third, he intentionally brought citrus with the with the, uh, you know, intent of planting it there on purpose. And not only that, people don't uh, something I left out of that video. Um, a lot of these uh, governors and conquistadors and warlords that were getting sent over to claim territory in the New World, people don't understand. They would get a lot of these deals, especially with, I think, Pedro Menendez, they would get paid half in cash, half in money. OK, the other wait, half wait, would ha be half. In, oh, OK. I thought you I thought you were saying one half was in cash and one half was in money, but it's the first half. Well, no. what's, what's the second well, half? <laughs> OK, so one half would be cash money. <laughs> the other half would be fruit and, and the potential of growing fruit on their land. They would be told you'll be rich if you grow this fruit on your land. So here's citrus, go to the new world. Well, with that citrus, a lot of these early expeditions were abandoned, right? Well, when they when different settlers came back hundreds of years later, they found the natives had completely ad adopted. Really? Everywhere. It was everywhere. Watch your video. They they came back. So they Christopher Columbus apparently brought the, the, the oranges and all the citrus and everything. It was perfect mm -hmm. in the Florida climate, not like anywhere else in the United States or in the world where there's irrigated. It's just not the same. This is the best mm -hmm. juice. And then they came back later, the Europeans, and they found it had just been planted out everywhere by the natives mm -hmm. and they were just experts at growing citrus. So I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that was just so no, good. Go ahead, the, sir. No, it's perfect. Yeah, the it was thriving. It was thriving in the new world. Um, so if the natives were, had it fully adopted by the time the next wave came in and that first wave was made up of conquistadors, warmongers. Okay. These people brought essentially Rottweilers to go tear apart the natives for fun. That's what they do for fun. A lot of the time wow. they'd rape it. They'd, they'd rape anyone. They didn't. smallpox on them to, uh, <laughs> to kill yeah. the, the natives and, and decimated like a, a, lo a lot of people yeah um, so they knew what they were doing go ahead sir. Uh, 
I don't mean to laugh at that, but but it is bad, yeah. it is it is comical the atrocity upon atrocity upon atrocity, and then we take their word as as um you know as if it's uh, the word of God. We're like, oh, that's that's what they said happened, so we'll just believe them. Mm-hmm. So if a bunch of murderous psychopaths are saying they brought citrus to the new world, and citrus was their essentially how they got paid, well. I think we should dig into that a little deeper. I think we should, especially when, you know, like you said, if you start looking at the religious connotations of orange, well, citrus literally translates to golden apple, Mm. right? And what's, what's, what's an apple? An apple's an Apollo. Apple is Apollo. Well, a golden Apollo, that's the sun. Um, and I have these old ads. I didn't put some of these ads in, in that video too, because a lot of times I'm finding this stuff out as I'm making the videos. And then once the video is posted, a lot of um, subscribers will send stuff they have on it. Um, I guess that's what discords are for. I guess I'm gonna have to make a discord or something, but um, basically I, Longa, this, this fascinates yeah. me because I'm a chef. I don't know if you know this, like, and uh, I'm also okay. in background. So I'm, I'm born in Australia, but my, where, where where my family come from is the land of citrus. They, I'm not talking mm. orange, the, the size of a half soccer ball, uh, huge, you know. So I understand the influence of the Moors in particular and mm-hmm. how this would have been an influence both in the Caribbean and in Florida and all of this area for such a long time. And it's been so hidden. And also um, uh, things about the Phoenicians uh, doing a lot of trade and uh, the huge yes. anchors. Okay, so there's, there's, there's John Saxer. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, you know, the house of Saxe is a raw family from Switzerland, I do believe. Yep. And, and all of the footage that, that you took of those, those huge anchors with the perfectly bored holes and all of that stuff from uh, all over Florida, in particular in Tampa and in Tampa Bay, uh, all of the channels dug the, the uh, uh, another, other stuff on Bemini. So I did a lot of work this morning. I've been watching this for literally hours and hours, bro. Um, it's, it's f- fascinating stuff, man. I don't even know how you got in contact with this old guy in the first place. So if you can tell the audience about John Sachs, John Saxer and uh, the, you know, the stone anchors, that would be fascinating. Yes. Yeah. I think, you know, that's kind of like the most exciting. I'll just be honest. That's kind of the most, can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes, sir. So, you know, that's no doubt the most exciting thing you'll find on my channel. Dare I say it's some of the most exciting shit you'll see in your life <laughs> is being some of pretty, the first being being some of the first people to be on this wave. And trust me, it's going to be a wave because you they already they're already sending their little Graham Hancocks and Randall Carlsons out to get ahead of this. Really? So uh just wait, wow. just wait and see what's gonna happen with the Atlantis um awakening. But Let's not get ahead of ourselves. This is a stone anchor, an ancient stone anchor. This is a typical one that you'd see, right? Well, I'll talk about, sorry, you asked, you know, you you asked some good questions and I, I think people would love to hear that. How did I meet John Saxer and stuff like that? Well, we can start here. This I mean, is I, saw an, the, I saw the story, but like, just if you might want to explain well, to them, they the wasn't audience. easy to get hold of really, was he? No. So this is an ancient stone anchor. Florida has some of the largest and oldest stone anchors in the world. Uh, this is what they look like. Yeah. The, these are some of the ones I found actually after making the documentary. So these are not in the documentary. Yeah. The Saxer stones and the Saxer saga. Now these ones were in the documentary. So the, the man himself. that's, that's John Saxer there on the right. He is of Royal descent. And you, and you can verify that it is no funny business. His last name is Saxer. If you go look at the Queen of England, the Queen of England's. Because they were fighting the Germans and they themselves were German. That's going to cause some problems when you're ruling Britain and Britain's fighting Germany. So they changed their name to Windsor, the name of the castle they were living in. So that's where you get your Windsors. Before that, they were called the Saxas, the Saxa Coburg Gotha. Okay. That man right there is a real Saxer with an R. He is descended from the Royal Von Sachs line of Swiss nobility. 
descended from Johann Ulrich Christian von Sack. Sorry, Ulrich. Fuck, what was his name? I don't know. And he's, this is the Merovingian line, isn't it? All the way back to Isaac. Sorry to interrupt yes. you, but that's, that's where this this is going, isn't it? So, and yeah. also the Sax the Saxons. Go ahead, sir. No, you know it better than I do, man, for sure. Yeah, I, it's my alley. This is what I do. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're you're fresh on it. Um, basically, yes, he is a real Saxon. The Saxons were the ruling class of the the German, the Franks the Allens, right? They were the ruling class, the Normans uh, above these people. And the Merovingians, they got segmented into a couple different bloodlines and kind of the not so good ones, the rotten ones kind of rose to the top and Mm -hmm. took over. Well, families like his kind of fell to the wayside as monarchies kind of got, um, you know, uh, phased out of society. Well, royal blood is worth something, and I am a believer in that, and I don't think it's what everyone thinks it is. It's not Disney, Frozen, um, you know, sparkly. The San Grael. So yeah. everyone thought the Holy Grail and uh, the alleged uh, bloodline of Jesus, I don't know, man, uh, you know, it's been hi- hi- hype it up in the Da Vinci Code and other type of Quasi fictional. I don't know, man. What do you think, Zach? Like this Listen, is so yeah, d- Doctor Doctor Longo. If we if we could just, I, I would like to go back to that picture of John. Are they right here? You know, I mean, but that that last one was quite striking, and I think it's important to just kind of discuss the implications of what we're looking at here. So uh, before I had found Doctor Longo and and seen the 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 Saxer saga. You know, I had seen around uh, all over the place down here uh, these these stone anchors, and they're of varying sizes. But you know, if a stone anchor this size uh, being used on just a standard sized ship, I, I think it's it's not feasible. It, it's not possible that they could fit it on there and have the capacity to uh, to hoist it up. I mean, why would you need an anchor this large on, you know, a standard clipper ship or uh, the, the ships that uh, were being used at that time? It only makes sense if it's going to be used with a ship that is much, much larger. Zach, apparently mm-hmm. uh, two of these is enough to anchor an aircraft carrier. One of them uh, are yeah. a, a huge U.S. warship. So yes. there's that. And this all goes back to the giants. Look at all those pictures of those huge people, those 24-foot people. Um, you know, there were giants. And then we're talking about all the flood evidence and everything. So, you know, this all ties into Noah and God destroying all of these abominations uh, right back into the Greek mythology and the Garden of Eden and all of this stuff. Um and, and, and you know, basically, the Garden of Eden and and ancient Egypt and, and and all that stuff being in Florida, not in Europe. So these things are really yeah. cooking my head. It's really hard to get my head. Around. We haven't even Sorry. really gotten to that stuff yet. I, I I don't know that we're even gonna have time to dive into this stuff fully. But Sorry, Zach. No, yeah, no, it's, it's okay. Much. It's okay. It's okay. Um, listen, I I, I want you to uh, uh, tell us what you've just pulled up here, uh, Narco. But. Uh, after this, uh, Vector, we've got to take the next caller because we've got uh, three okay, people man. on the line still. So go, go ahead. Um, well, great stuff, Vector. Feel free to reach out to me on Instagram I will, I will, directly. I will. I will. Yes, great I will. stuff. Great, great. Uh, you, artic- you, man. you articulated so great, greatly. And but, you have um, a gorgeous girlfriend, by the way. Absolutely fabulous. <laughs> like, uh, I hope you're still together. So there's that. That's my sister. Oh really? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've been watching it, bro. I know you're a good troller. You're all right, eh? Hey? You're all right. Yeah, yeah. You can stay, mate. You can stay on my couch anytime. All right, let's go, Brandon. Right. Go ahead, sir. Thanks. All right. Who were the Glades Giants? Were they born that way, or did ancient Indians use bone stretching formula? I think you've been using a little bit of that bone stretching formula, Vector. <laughs> Maybe it's that penis stretching formula. <laughs> 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 um, but it's that. But anyway, um, you're going to love my show, bro. You got to come on and do an interview. Sorry, but anyway, okay. go ahead. I'm sure. taking over Zach's show. He's going to. That's all me. good. Um, That's all good. <laughs> I've un- I've highlighted the important parts here. We're, I'm just trying to paint a picture. Yes, so we just saw the giant fucking anchors, the yeah. biggest anchors on the planet. That's kind of why I showed you the giants at the beginning. 
so we can get a picture of what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Well, this kind of pinpoints it back in Florida. Who were the Glades Giants? Well, this is going to show you that there was possibly a maritime culture because they would have had to have gone from the tip of Florida to the tip of the Yucatan, which was not very far at all. Not very far, but you would need a ship. Could these people have been descendants of the Mayas of the Yucatan? Blah, blah, blah. Were they early Calusas? Were they originally like Maya, a race of cannibals? I don't know if that's necessarily true. Right. No, no Spanish historians seem to classify Calusas as cannibals. So they, they just admit that, that that's just pure conjecture. We have giant basketball players and football players today, as well as giant African tribes. So they tie it to possible giant African tribes, um, which I think is true because I'm going to show you another picture here where we clearly see the Florida natives were, um, were uh, biblical people, Semitic wow. people. Mm -hmm. name, wow, named bro. in the Bible. And from Seminole, you get the word, sorry, from Semitic, you oh, get yeah. the word Seminole. It's just a different suffix right. to the same root word. It's like saying Creole instead of um, Cre, you know, Creetic or something, if, if you were say, uh, describing people on the other side of the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just a, uh, it, it's an American suffix, Ol, Ola, Appalachicola, right? Coca-Cola. Um, You're teaching yeah. me so much that I didn't understand about America. Like, I'm mind blown. I don't know what to say. You're in, you're in Australia, you said? Yes, I'm in Brisbane, the world's most livable city in Bris Vegas, the, uh, the other sunshine <laughs> state. Exactly. So is it is the other sunshine state. And Florida is... is oh, Florida Listen, I is... Go because I, I know there's so many okay. people here, bro, but I, I just have to say the cane toad was introduced from South America to eat the cane beetle in Australia. It didn't mm -hmm. eat the cane beetle. It ate all the native fauna and flora. It's totally what you were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're fucking everywhere here. We play golf with these things. Not me, of course, because I love <laughs> yeah. them. Um, but uh, they are a pest. And they That's what I was doing. Across the, country. the snakes <laughs> eat them and die. So we fucking hate the cane toads. And uh, basically, the Queensland uh, Rugby League team mascot is the cane toad, and New South Wales is the cockroaches. So all the Australians know about the Austra uh, the uh, uh, the derby between the two states, Queensland and New Zealand, and uh, New South Wales. So uh, there's so much going on here with Florida, my spiritual home. I don't want to take up too much time, Rupert, because I feel bad about the people on the line. Um, so maybe you want to bring the next person on, and uh, I'll get in touch with uh dr longo you're a legend brother and i'm stoned to shit as well so don't worry it's all good <laughs> hang up all right. dude all right you're a legend all right i love you thanks Vector. Thanks, we'll see thanks. you dude appreciate it okay oh and tamar you were the next caller and you just hung up damn it okay well call, get back on the line and uh and i will bring you back so were you you were playing golf with a cane toad is that how you got stuck in the eye with the i was kind of I was kind of being a piece of shit and kicking them with my friends. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's how got, it happened. They got revenge on you. All right. So we're going to bring in the next caller. Tamar, if you get back on the line, I will take you as soon as we're done with this caller. Caller, you're on the air. Can I get a name? Hi, Zach. This is First Amendment Rights. First Amendment Rights. It's so good to hear from you, fellow Floridian. Uh, are you enjoying the show tonight? Hey, Dr. Longo, I have so enjoyed this um, show. I have so enjoyed it. Um, here's my question. What connection to, if, you, if there is one, and I'm asking because you seem so incredibly knowledgeable in this history that, you know, truth is coming out and uh, all lies will be revealed and start to life. And you know what I'm saying? And what, if any connection is there between what you found in Florida's history to the Sumerian, if at all? Uh, but I'm, I would love to know what your um, understanding is of the Sumerians and the relationship between the Sumerians and, and Florida, if any? Of course, <clears throat> that's a good question. And uh, thank you, thank you for that. Basically, there's two parts to that. Sumeria, you know, if you've followed my channel a little bit, I make the Finnish is Phoenician connection. 
Finnish is Phoenician. Uh, yeah. Phoenician went by the word Punic. Okay. Finnish went by the word runic. So there's another connection. Well, Sumerian, which is supposedly the oldest civilization and oldest, um, you know, one of like the oldest hieroglyphics or what do they call it? Cuneiform writings, right? Well, that Sumerian, the oldest civilization is Sami or Suomi, Suomi, which is what the Finnish call themselves. The Finnish call themselves Suomi. So when you see those old um, Sumerian men with their long bok beards, their, their long beards and their, their pointy hats, that's what Phoenicians look like. That's what Finnish people look like up in the North Pole. So this ancient maritime race came down from the North Pole at one time. But how how does civilization start, start, quote unquote, it didn't start in Sumeria, but how did it start in Sumeria? It restarted in Sumeria. Sumeria is where civilization was restarted. Now, why is that? Because an ark left Florida after a flood, a tsunami, whatever you want to call it, a cataclysm, an asteroid, probably the Chicxulub crater, Chicxulub crater, the dinosaurs, quote unquote dinosaurs. Mm. Well, that would have sent a shockwave right to Florida. That's where you get all the anchors getting tossed up on the land. But if you were a big ancient ark, maybe from Arkansas, Arkansas that has the most biblical names of any city in America, sorry, of any state in America, Arkansas, because it has the most Mississippian coastline. That's the river of Isis, Mississippi, Mississippi. Well, Arkansas, you had arcs going down the Mississippi River. Well, Florida was a um, center of trade for this ancient maritime culture, just like it, just like it is today with uh, the world's produce and its well, you get the idea. If these arcs were out on the open sea, on the open sea, when this cataclysm happened, and they were truly out in the middle of the Atlantic or high up off the coast of Florida, they would not even know that this cataclysm had happened. And they would be out on the open ocean where they would not even notice a tsunami. And they would if this, the sea levels changed and there was great ch changes happening underneath them with the waters and the, and the tectonic plates shifting, God knows how extreme this cataclysm was. You know, uh, Randall Carlson and Graham Hancock certainly have their own take, take on the whole thing. Well, whatever happened, these ships wouldn't have been able to return to Florida because this, Florida is so low to, low to the sea that any disturbance could leave it covered for days, weeks, months. You know, we just saw what happened with a, even just a hurricane can leave entire portions of Florida underwater for weeks. Well, this ship would have landed and it did land. This was Noah's Ark um, landed in the mountains of Ararat. And you find ancient stone anchors on the, on the mountains of Ararat in Armenia. And you find an old petrified ship. They're not so uh, eager to admit that that's an, an actual petrified ship, but you can go look it up. It looks like a petrified ship. Mm -hmm. um, Narco, but, if, if, I, if I may, yeah. just before you continue... So the stone anchors, are they coquina stone anchors? Are they the same type of stone anchors? That's a good question. And that's why I say this arc in particular that landed in the mountains of Ararat, the one that survived, and this is like Noah, Noah's Ark, right? And Noah's Ark Correct. means many things, but that, that arc would have been coming from far, farther north in the Americas, either okay. Georgia, Apalachicola River, or... Um, Mississippi, Arkansas area, because that's granite. Everything in Florida is kakina, 
Mm-hmm. And and those giant Kakina blocks, those would have needed giants, right? Mm-hmm. The blocks that are in Mount Ararat, they're big and they're really big. And humans would have a tough time moving them, but they could move them. The one that we find in in the front yard there with, with John Saxer, the tall one that, that's twice his height. Mm-hmm. No amount of humans is going to move that and get it on a boat. But the ones in Mount Ararat theoretically are small enough to where they could be used by a group of men. And that those are granite or some type of very hard rock that is not Kakina. So those are not Kakina. They don't originate from Florida. But we do know that Noah's Ark in the Bible was written it was written that it was made from gopher wood. Gopher wood only exists in the Apalachicola River area of Northwest Florida. And that's what the Ark was supposedly made out of. And I believe that to be true. I believe that area was an Ark building center. Well, why do I believe that? There's an Ark Adelphia, not far from there. There's Arkansas. There are many, many Ark names around that Prefixes. area exactly and i don't think that's just just by coincidence i don't think i don't think that those are just mormons naming things for fun sure and to tie it back into sumeria those people that would have survived this flood and landed in the mountains of ararat when they came down from the mountains they made their way and civilization began to <laughs> began to rebuild itself. And Sumeria would have been one of those first rebuilding spots. Now there's another way to look at that. And like I said, there's two ways to look at that. That's the Noah's flood part. If you look at it from the Bach saga angle, after this cataclysm, the reset was many people leaving the North Pole and coming back to these lands that were destroyed. And from the North Pole, from Finland, essentially, they re-implemented society to the the sparse, uh, devastated survivors in the tropical lands. So when they got to Sumeria, this is where the word, I'm going to tell you where the word Babylon comes from. When they got to Sumeria, these tribes that were originally benevolent and were, were welcomed as gods because they because they brought agriculture, written language, and domesticated animals with, with them wherever they went. Well, when they got to Babylon, this one group, and in the Bach, in the Bach saga, it says it's India, but I, I believe it was Babylon where the first sins were committed after the flood. And this sin is actually civilization itself. It's like the beast, the Babylon system, where Babylon, like the reggae artists always say, is like a personification of evil and industrialism technology, transhumanism, even in, even in the ancient context. Um, Sumeria is where a lot of these societal uh, social engineering started happening with bad intentions. And f- that's why we are told civilization started in Babylon, in Sumeria, because they want us to live a Babylonian culture, society that that they're telling us has its roots in Babylon. I don't think I'm from Babylon. I don't think my culture comes from that area. But that's what that's what they try and convince us of in um, in school. So those were just survivors that restarted near Sumeria. Fascinating stuff. All right. First and Amendment I, rights. Uh, please continue. Dr. Alonzo's channel or website. Do you have a uh, website? Is that yes. what you said? Yes. Yes. My my assistant is help helping me make a website right now, but it's not up and running yet. But I'm on Instagram at old underscore world underscore Florida and my YouTube, of course. Which is also Thank Old you. World Florida. Uh, you can get to the links of both of those in the description of this video. Okay. Thank you so much. Merry Christmas. 
Merry Christmas, and I look forward to talking to you in the New Year's well. Absolutely. Thanks. Merry Christmas to you, too. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Good we'll question. Bye-bye. Yeah. Excellent stuff. Uh, I was actually, I wanted to ask the same thing, but about the Phoenicians. I'm from Michigan, and in Michigan, we've got ancient copper mines all over the place. And I know that mm-hmm. the Phoenicians were a seafaring culture, uh, and uh, and their copper work can be found in many different ancient sites. But I just wondered if there was anything uh, here in Florida that linked to the Phoenicians as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, to talk about the copper, why the copper is so important is because the Phoenicians built their empire off of copper and tin. Mm-hmm. The, the tin came from the British Isles, largely. That's where we get the word Britain. Okay. Um, and with, um, what was the other one? Sorry, I'm spaced out. What was the other metal? Copper. So copper. the copper, like you said, was coming from the Michigan, the Ohio, even down towards Mississippi area, the, the Mississippi River and Ohio River Valley areas. Mm-hmm. Well, that copper, even though it was being mined in ancient mines, is missing largely from the American archaeological record. And they don't know why. Mm-hmm. Well, it's pretty obvious why. Because the Phoenicians were shipping it across the Atlantic. They were coming here. Number one, the Romans and the Greek. Why? It's, it's so backwards we look to the romans and the greek and say well why didn't they know the new world was here why didn't they know the americas were there because the phoenicians never let them out of the mediterranean sea so of course they wouldn't know there's a land mass across the atlantic the romans did not start um exploring outside the pillars of hercules straits of gibraltar until the Phoenician empire was in a completely weakened state, right? And they were no longer able to keep the Romans out Mm -hmm. or keep them, keep them in the Mediterranean. So the Phoenicians had complete uh, dominion over the Atlantic. They could travel the open seas in the night with no visual aids. So they could leave the coastline. The Romans and the Greeks had to keep the, and the Egyptians and the Etruscans had to keep the coastline in view or else they'd get lost, mm-hmm. right? Because they didn't know the nature of the heavens like the Phoenicians did. And the Phoenicians, this is how you know the Phoenicians are Vikings as well. Vikings and Phoenicians are the same people. Okay. Okay. They are. People do not want to admit this. And I don't hear enough people saying this on YouTube. In fact, I don't hear anybody saying this on YouTube except for Connor McDarry, who was an author. There's some of his narrations out on YouTube. Connor McDarry, I recommend his work okay. to everyone. Basically, you know, the Mormons were all about the Old Testament happening in, um, in North America. Mm-hmm. And look at their name. They have the word more right in their name. Like Moors? Exactly. Okay. So that's it. That it's all in in the phonetics. You know, if only people understood what what stories are in each word that we tell. Good stuff. But I'm gonna gonna show you. I'm I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay. You asked to really, and feel free to bring bring someone else on. I'm I'm just gonna call. Well, you go ahead and keep talking, and I'm gonna bring Bruce in. I just didn't want him to hang up and um, and lose him. Eric, you are the next caller after that, but um. Uh, Also, let me, I have a couple of thank yous from Super Chats on Rumble. Uh, Casey Collins says, has Dr. Longo ever heard of the book 1491, New Revelations of the Americas Before Columbus by the author Charles C. Mann? Totally opened my eyes. Are you familiar with that work? No? No. Okay. Well, put it, put it, put it on your list. Uh, And then Design Lady LA said, this is one of the most interesting shows you've had. Any info about the underwater finds in Miami? near the DuPont Hotel. Well, I'm, I think I'm learning more than I'm teaching on, <laughs> on this one. I okay. haven't heard DuPont Hotel underwater. I know about the Miami Circle. I know about the aquifers that are pretty much free to tap into. Mm-hmm. That, that the Vizcaya Museum's big Kina Castle in Miami. 
uh, Coral Gables area. They have a big open swimming pool that just draws water straight from the Florida aquifer and it's crystal clear. It glows turquoise blue, just like the Florida Springs. Um, and then you have the Venetian pools, Venetian, right? You asked about Phoenicians. Mm -hmm. Well, Phoeni Phoenician is Venetian, okay? Venetian pools in Florida made out of Kakina rock, same stuff the coral castles made out of. Also that the city fills with this uh, water. Every day they fill it up with the water from, from underground, essentially. And the people that live in Miami go and, go and live in it. But I don't know specifically about that. But feel free to reach out to me on Instagram with good leads and stuff. I, okay. I, do, I always incorporate um, people's leads that they send me. If they're good, I'll make a whole video out of it. I've done it All before. Right. Uh, Design Lady LA, if you can send any more specific information, I've attempted to search and find something with uh, the tidbits that you left, but I, I can't find anything relevant to underwater archaeological finds with uh, uh, that info. So if you have any links, I would love to see that myself. Um, also, one more. Where we go one, we go all 38 mm -hmm. says, thank you again, RP, for all you do. Dr. Narco Longo, you are a refreshing break and look forward to subscri subscribing to you on YouTube. Uh, are you able to share anything on Florida Haunted Highway? I, I have heard of that one. So that's not news to me, but I, I will say it's not my expertise at all. I'm not like a paranormal researcher by any means. Okay. Um, I, do, I do think it plays in to the the whole big picture, of course, St. Augustine being the most, oh yeah, pretty much, pretty much one of the most haunted cities in the world, unanimously declared. Mm -hmm. You know, half the people that go there, it seems like, have some type of experience. Um. So no, I'd love to hear about that too. Okay, you know? awesome. Uh, well, uh, on that note, I will uh, now kick it over to Bruce. Bruce, I, I was uh, just wondering where you've been. It's good to see you. I hope you're doing all right. Thank you, Brother Zach. Yes, yeah. um, I'm good. Um, I was down in Florida. Uh, I sent you a couple of texts. I don't know if you got oh, them. Oh, no, but, um, I, dude, no. I, th I thought that that wasn't happening until I thought I, I thought we still had time. I'm sorry. I didn't know you were down here, dude. Yeah, no, that's okay. Don't worry about okay. it. Um, I'll be back again in March and April. So Okay. Just call um, I may me. have to come back. Yeah, absolutely. I may have to be back sooner. Mom's having some more trouble, oh, unfortunately. Sorry to hear um, that. So if everybody out there can keep Mama Wayne in your prayers, I'd appreciate it. Her uh, Parkinson's disease has gotten really bad, and her dementia has increased substantially, where we have to get uh, nurse aides around the clock now to be with her. I'm so sorry <laughs> to hear that, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so if, if all goes well, I, I won't have to come back until March, but there's a good chance I might have to come back just after the new year. But okay. let's digress from that. And I will get in touch with you before I come down. Perfect. Uh, Dr. Longo, pleasure to meet you. Thank you for your information. This is the kind of stuff we need as a distraction from all the craziness of the uh, bizarro world that we've been living in. And based on your information that you're putting out there, that uh, there were other bizarre worlds before this one. <laughs> and I just have to ask you, because there was a video that popped up about eight, nine months ago, where they, uh, I think it was Unveiled, was the name of the channel on YouTube, where they talk about mountains possibly being the remains of petrified trees from the giant civilization. And I wanted to know if you had any information on that or if you've done any research on that. Yeah, there is a specific site out west, and I want to say it's like Devil's, Devil's Tower. Devil's Tower, that's it, yes. Which was used in the movie, wasn't it? Uh, Close, Close Encounters. Encounters of the Third Kind. Yep, yep. So based on that premise, have you done any research or have you done any digging on that aspect of uh, you know, with the giants being around, that those are their tr the tree stumps that are left over. I mean, we don't have any things that big in Florida, but I'm definitely behind the theory that that one in particular, Devil's Tower, was something that was sawed in half. Now, as for just all mountain ranges 
being leftover petrified wood. I think I'd have to see more on that before I, you know, would teach or preach that myself. But I will say I've never seen a mountain getting made. I don't (laughs) think anyone's seen a mountain getting made. And how are we going to believe that this is just like an incremental process where that, that just starts out as flat land and it just takes millions of years to just push up and then, you know, but then at the same time, sometimes they'll tell us it's all sudden and that mountain ranges can just appear at, in, you know, a tectonic uh, upheaval pretty much that they can just pop up. And I've never seen that either. I've never seen a mountain created. We have volcanoes, we have this and that, but I've never seen elevation be generated from scratch. So I think that is important. And I do think when we look at areas like the Grand Canyon, you know, where is all the water coming from where we had another couple hundred feet of water level, ocean level? And are they telling us it's ocean that that whittled down the Grand Canyon? I have a hard time getting behind that, (laughs) you know. Was it the was it the Colorado River that was just much higher? You know that doesn't make much sense to me to me either. That that these these rivers just whittle a straight course, you know, winding course through these these incredibly hard cliffs. You know. Yeah, absolutely. So. I I can drop that YouTube link in the chat if. I don't know if I have privilege or right to do so. Zach, would it yeah, be okay if I did? yeah, there's there's yeah, you, you don't yeah, you you're always welcome to drop links in the chat. Okay. I, I know some people are weird about that stuff, but I I encourage it. That's totally cool. Okay, so I just put it in the chats, but that's the YouTube video, Dr. Longo, that directly relates to the un- unveiled site that put up that video eight months ago about certain uh, mountain ranges actually becoming a, uh, you know, or, or leftover petrified stumps, not mm-hmm. all of them, but, but specific ones. And when you watch the video, you'll be amazed at how they all look like tree stumps and they do comparisons, which mm-hmm. is amazing. But uh, I just want to thank you very much, Zach. I'll get, I'll be in touch, brother. All right. Good, uh, good stuff. Yeah. I want to, I want to, I want to go fishing with you. Ha ha ha. Oh, dude. Uh, I'd be totally down. Totally down. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. The, la- the last time Bruce was here, we went to, uh, we went to lunch at the funky Pelican on uh, Flagler beach and that pier. Uh, I don't know if you saw this Bruce, but the pier has been uh, uh, essentially wiped away. Like half of it's no. gone. Yeah. A lot of no. our beach is gone too now. And um, Matanzas beach, which is probably my, my, favorite place to go in the area. Um, you know, a lot of that coquina bedrock has been exposed. Uh, it used to be, there was just a couple of specific spots where you'd go out on these outcroppings and kind of walk out into the ocean on it. And now it's like, it's all coquina. Uh, the beaches have just been torn away over here. It's, uh, it, 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 I mean, it's part of the natural process I know, and that sand will probably get redeposited. But in the meantime, uh, down there in Flagler beach, we've got a lot of people whose uh, houses are at risk right now. So did Funky Pelican get uh, damaged? No, no, no. They haven't been damaged, right. but it's just the pier is going to have to be totally rebuilt. That's a shame. That's yeah. a shame. Yeah. But um, I, I hope and pray they are able to fix that up too real quick. Absolutely. But uh, I will be in touch. And right, again, bro. Dr. Longo, thank you so much for your insightful information. God bless everybody. God bless you, brother. Peace out from Batman. All right. We'll see you. <clears throat> All right. Good stuff. And um, we've got Eric on the phone next, bringing you in. And, uh, and you know, and uh, Narco, I, I hope to have you back on the show again in the future. Um, there's uh, so much more that I want to, like, dive into, do some some deep stuff on. Uh, and obviously, we don't have time necessarily tonight, but uh, I, I love the stuff that we've been able to touch on so far. Um, Eric, <laughs> I love your picture, Eric. That's great. Um and let me just see here. Uh, over on the foxhole, Rise Attire, thank you very much. He says, I come for the gold pills and I stay for the woo. Uh, Nakaz808 says, such an interesting show. Great way to open up your mind. 
Thank you to Porpoiseful for that cookie. Matt1776 says red pill. That's it. This is a big red pill. Uh, Gambera, thank you for that chip. And then Chops ITMC uh, says a cookie for the guest. What do you know of the crushed trilobite under a human foot in Texas? Do you know anything about that? No. Mm -hmm. All right. You're going to have to go through and watch the show yourself so that you can get all of these uh, tidbits and ch look into it. Um, yep. there, there was another, uh, uh, like a, 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 a giant site that I believe was in Texas. It had, uh, it was something to do with a wall. It was like mm -hmm. a giant underground wall that was built. And I believe that they found like rooms that had been dug in as well. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So my, my friend, uh, working partner, colleague, I guess you could say, um, Ben from analog waking up with analog. Okay. He did. I think an ambulance is going to go by. So sorry. It's no but, worries. um, basically the, uh, what are we talking about? <laughs> Texas giant. I want to say it's okay, like Kens yeah. Kensington so, or something like that. Well, that's, there's the Kensington room. <laughs> runestone okay. which is something else but i think rock you could wall. be right rock wall i think that it's rock wall texas that's that's what i'm thinking of but the kensington rune you're that yeah i'm mixing my uh archaeological mm -hmm. metaphors so there was a wall a great wall they call it like the mississippian wall mm -hmm. they call it the great wall of texas the great wall of um, another state they call it and basically it didn't just stop at texas it went down farther south and it went very far north of texas too okay. and it was likened to the great wall of china by just about every early explorer that saw it and so credit to ben from analog waking up with analog um you can find him on my channel of course he works with karimo too if you guys know karimo on youtube well he found this old article that's at least a hundred years old, probably mm -hmm. like 150. And it flat out shows it's, and I don't think it's just one article. I think it's multiple articles corroborating mm -hmm. this great wall of America mm -hmm. that, that was mostly in or around Texas. Yeah. I know that so there I, was also uh, giant tools that were found there, or perhaps even a giant skeleton and um, but yes, the uh, the account that I that I read of like the the living quarters, essentially, I mean, it was just, you know, massive. And uh, and of course, the the skeleton and the accompanying tools, uh, you know, it paints quite well, the picture. You know, we I don't always talk about like the Southwest because it's not my territory. You know, there's tons of researchers that do a great, mm -hmm. great job over there. Like John Levy, I think is yeah. um, I'm not like I'm not a big viewer of john levy but i know he does i think he's over there in the southwest and he kind of focuses on that area so it's not my the focus of my research whatsoever right but but we've all heard those stories of ancient egyptian temples mm -hmm. in the the grand canyon yes under the rocks in arizona in the caves red-haired giants mm -hmm. in arizona stuff like that so even Lincoln talked about the red haired giants from, um, from, you know, like the Midwest, mm -hmm. Midwest United States. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, you asked earlier about Phoenicians and I don't think I, I actually got to the point and showed you what you were asking for. I can show you um, exactly what, what you were looking for earlier. Mm -hmm. I, I had it up on the screen for a little, I just didn't say anything. Here we go. This is from this was from a Spanish doctor, Pedro de Santander, who may or may not be Pedro um, Menendez de Alaves. I'm not sure if it was him or not, the famous conquistador, because he died in Santander, but he wasn't born in Santander. So Dr. Pedro de Santander, I don't know if he was a doctor either, blah, blah, blah. It is lawful that your majesty, like a good shepherd appointed by the hand of the eternal father, should tend and lead out your sheep, since the Holy Spirit has shown spreading pastures whereupon are feeding lost sheep, lost sheep, which have been snatched away by the dragon. And remember, America means land of the dragon, and 
I think I said that on the tinfoil podcast, but I didn't say this. I forgot to say this. So exclusive red pill podcast guys only going to get it here. Dragon. Well, one of the first um, discoverers, I don't know if you could say that, but one of the first major players in America, especially English America was Francis Drake, Mm -hmm. Francis Drake, right? Now, from Drake, Drake is the same root word as dragon and draconian, but we'll get, that's a topic for another time, maybe another episode, okay. Francis, Francis Drake, pirates, stuff like that. Snatched away by the dragon, the demon. These pastures are the new world, wherein is comprised Florida, now in possession of the demon. And here he makes himself adored and revered. This is the land of promise possessed by idolaters, the Amorite, Amalekite, Moabite, and Canaanite. Commanded by, wait, this is the land promised by the eternal father to the faithful. Since we are commanded by God and the holy scriptures to take it from them, being idolaters, and by reason of their idolatry and sin, to put them all to the knife, leaving no living thing save maidens and children, their cities robbed, and sacked their walls and houses leveled to the earth damn that's what they did yeah and and but the important part right right there the major takeaway amorite amalekite moabite and canaanite Mm -hmm. if you've read the first first book of the bible genesis you will know these are the inhabitants of the fertile crescent Mm -hmm. mesopotamia well, Mesopotamia is Mexopotamia. The Gulf of Mexico is the one and only true fertile crescent. And this, uh, it may not verify it, although I think it does. It certainly substantiates it. The Amorite are Syrians. Mm-hmm. If you look up Amorite, the definition of Amorite, that Syrian, well, that's also where we get the word more Amorite. Amalekite. Well, Malachite comes from the Congo. Moabite. That's a desert. That's a biblical desert. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's where we named one of our um, national parks after. Right? Moab. Yeah. Exactly. So Canaanite. Now, Canaanite is the important one because almost everyone in the Old Testament is some type of a Canaanite. Canaanite yeah. And the Phoenicians are explicitly... Canaanites. That is confirmed. The Phoenicians are Canaanites. Now we're told that Canaan, Canaan, was just a little tiny little strip of Israel and and, uh, Cyprus. And yeah, they had some territory in North Africa. Well, their territory in Israel was tiny, abysmal compared to the empires that they rivaled just next door now carthage is more telling of their true power carthage was a big 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 chunk of north africa right Mm -hmm. and that was controlled by the phoenicians so the phoenician homeland is just this tiny little strip of of israel because you know the greeks the greek homeland was small but not that small it was big enough where you could you could wrap your head around them subjugating the people around them with the Phoenicians, okay, how did they sustain themselves when they weren't on their boats? What was their true homeland? What was their true food? What was their purpose other than just mercantile, you know, um, lifestyle? It seems like they didn't have any. They have no written history, to our knowledge, virtually none. And what they do have comes from Carthage, right? Mm-hmm. Well, just the the regular seafaring Phoenicians, we don't hear much about. We we hear so little about them. Um, Carthage was destroyed, right? Rome came out victorious, or at least painted themselves as victorious, and maybe the vic- victory wasn't as uh, swift as they've led us to believe. Maybe this victory was drawn out very very up until the recent day 
And that's what we've been lied to about. <clears throat> of the mid 1800s were between the Catholics persecuting who they see as rivals, as a threat to their claim to, you know, spiritual superiority. And these four, four names being named right here in Florida is of extreme, extreme importance. Certainly. If we're you know, I also, I, I heard you mention something about uh, red-haired Phoenicians earlier, but I mean, in, in, in with the, when you put that together with the statement that you made that the Phoenicians were the Vikings, I mean, obviously Vikings were said to have red hair as well. Um, mm -hmm. I would like to dive into that idea uh, at a later date too, but we are almost at the end of the show and we've got Eric on the line. Eric, uh, can you go ahead and unmute? And yes, certainly, certainly, Zach. Hey, welcome to the program. How are you? Good, good. Just enjoying the, the conversation. It's a great conversation. It's just, your, your comments about the, the copper in Pennsylvania while he was talking about the art brought, brought up some interesting points that I, I've, I've come across in my own like research of just biblical archaeology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. You too, if you like, it's just like a, a, a summarization. Somebody's at like an unbiased yeah. opinion and summarization of Ron Wyatt's amateur archaeological discoveries. So the boat he's talking about that's petrified is, and and it's in the mountains of Ararat. It's not actually it's on not on what we actually call the mountain of Ararat, which is a single mountain. Mm -hmm. It's on a mountain about six miles away. But in that time period, that that entire area was Ararat, so it would have been the mountains of Ararat, not a single mountain. It would have been sure. an entire range. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. But but so there are the, the way that they first outlined it and found this boat before they started digging up like the petrified remains of it was with metal detectors. And there shouldn't have been metal at this time because you're talking uh, around 5000 B.C. or around a long time ago. You know, it's the it's the first account after Adam. You know, Noah was the uh, the the 11th generation on the planet. Right. Mm -hmm. Adam being the first. Noah would have been the 11th. Right. So so, so and then. What we should consider, right, so Noah's Ark could have been built anywhere. We don't really get a lot of geological information from, from the Bible or geographical information from the Bible about where Noah settled and those people and where it was built. Because you have to remember around another 800 to 1,000 years after Noah's Ark was the Tower of Babel, the account of the Tower of Babel. So that entire period would have been on if you learned about Pangea in school. Mm -hmm. When the continents were all mostly connected, that's when the story of Noah would have taken place. And it would have been about 800 to 1,000 years later when the Tower of Babel was built and the continents were divided, or what, what science likes to call maybe the Younger Dryas event. Sure. But I, I just thought that was a, a neat point he had talked on there. It made, it made me think back to the, uh, the Ark, because I'd watched that recently. But a great show. I love it. I love this type of conversation. They're, awesome. they're very interesting. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate you calling in. Uh, Narco, uh, tell us uh, what we're looking at here with the, I mean, the similarities are stunning. Right. <clears throat> so this is kind of the uh, holy grail of mm -hmm. archaeology that they will not allow the people the satisfaction of, of understanding. Um, this simple fact alone of Finnish being Phoenician stitches together two halves of, of history that we're told have no relation whatsoever, even though it's a, apparent. Geographically, it's apparent. Linguistically, it's apparent, right? That basically the Phoenicians are some of the oldest, you know, uh, civilized, complex, maritime people that we know of. They were tall taller than their opponents on average. They typically had what we'd call a uh, more European bearded, long bearded genes. So certainly not sub-Saharan, sub-Saharan African. Um, if it, they did have North African genes originally, they would have been very little. These were Phoenician people, I believe, were Finnish in origin. And they would have taught seafaring to the people that they met in their colonies, such as North Africa. But the Phoenicians did not originate in the Mediterranean. I think this is very, very apparent. These boats, these dragon boats, so both a Phoenician boat 
and a Finnish Viking boat would have been called a dragon boat because they had a dragon, sometimes maybe a phoenix, mm-hmm. on their on their uh, bow on the front of their ship. And basically, um, this is also where you get the two oldest written alphabets in the world. Phoenician is Punic. And you actually get the word Punic from Phoenician. We'll turn that PH into a P, turn that OE into a U, and then you have Punic. Phonic, phonic, phonic is Punic. Viking, there's Swedish, there's Norwegian. Well, there's also Finnish. And Finnish Vikings are, Finnish is... So many rabbit holes, you know, I'm trying to keep (laughs) keep, for the sake of brevity. J.R.R. Tolkien knew much of this. And he used Finnish to construct his Elvin, Elfin languages. Mm -hmm. Elfin is Finnish. The elves, El is the Phoenician word for God. Finn is what the Phoenicians were referred to. In Ireland, they were called Finnegan, Finnegans. Or Finns. Well, in Finland, they call themselves Suomi. That's where you get Sumerian, because when they land in Sumeria, when they land in Iraq, they start calling themselves Suomi or Suomeria. Right. So that's where you get your Sumerian from. Um, but the Punic runic connection is important. It's just as important as this Viking ship. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Um, I, you know, I've also seen uh, comparisons uh, of the Phoenician alphabet to the runic alphabet, and it's, uh, you know, fairly similar, too. Oh, it's exact. Yeah, yeah. Can you still see my screen? Yeah. That yep. is runic on the top. That is, sorry, punic on the top, runic on the bottom. Mm-hmm. And it is purely coincidence that that spells out fupa. I actually did not know that until <laughs> Sam, until Sam, and Sam Tripoli pointed that out to me. I didn't even know. Oh I didn't realize. Gosh. But written by Vikings, mm-hmm. Punic would have been written by the Phoenicians. Both of these people were Rome's greatest enemies so what did rome do rome took their two biggest or actually their one so that's what i'm getting at Mm -hmm. rome took their one greatest opponent and split them in half in history Mm -hmm. and said oh this smaller empire we dealt with and this other smaller empire we dealt with at a different time when really that was a empire that rivaled rome in size, strength, technology, if not surpassed Rome. And it was probably through treachery that Rome conquered this this, uh, nation, not through just strength um, alone. And, well, that's, that's really it. Runic, Punic, the ships are the same. This is your two ancient seafaring people. The only seafaring people that could travel the open seas in in the ancient world were the Vikings and the Phoenicians. They both knew how to use the stars. The Romans and Greeks did not. The Egyptians, not so much. And their writing system is the same. And this is important. Why? Because these are descendants, common ancestors of, sorry, common descendants Descendants who share a common ancestor, and that ancestor is the Atlanteans. They come <laughs> from the Atlantic. Oh man! Okay, I want to I want to talk about Atlantis on the next show because there is just so much there. Uh, yeah, I've had a great time hanging out with you tonight. I want to thank you very much for being here. I need to say thank you to uh, Filter Dog One who says, "Boom! Great show! Bring him back. We'll set that up. Don't go anywhere when I end the show for the audience because I want to make sure that we talk uh, about this." And then Omazon says, "You always get your money's worth from sex guests. Great show. Uh, I'm glad that everybody enjoyed it. Uh, you know, Narco. At the end of the show, I always like to ask the guest, uh, "What would you like the audience to most take away from our conversation tonight?" Man, 
should have gave me uh should have given me some time to think about that one <laughs> but um uh ingest more citrus smoke more pot drink less alcohol and i think i think that can only help you not hurt you okay so All- All right. Uh, Once again, thank you for being here. Thank you to everybody out in the audience. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pass out the gold pills over on the foxhole. So I have one one last question. Is red pill the antithesis to blue chew? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely the antithesis to blue anything. Um, But yeah, the... uh, uh, Blue chew, blue chew. I don't understand the the Those are the boner pills. <laughs> oh, that Sam has it as an advertiser. Okay. Yeah. 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 You're 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 guaranteed to have uh plenty of testosterone and uh manly affectation by taking the red pill. Okay. The the uh the the gold pills have been passed out over on Foxhole. Thank you very much for hanging out with us tonight. Tomorrow night I have uh two guests actually at, at 8 30. Jake Lang is going to be calling into the show from his new prison digs. Uh, If everybody is uh, familiar with Jake, he is one of the January 6th defendants. He has been held uh, without trial for uh, a really long time now. Uh, And then at 9 p.m., Loy Brunson, who is uh, the man behind that very important Supreme Court case, which is coming up uh, before the justices very shortly, he'll be here at 9 p.m. So be here early tomorrow night at 8.30, and then we're going to have a full show after that. Narco, thank you again for being here. I really appreciate it. Don't go anywhere. And for everybody else at home, we'll see you tomorrow. Good luck and God bless.